Hello, everybody. I'm Mark Coleman, your co-host again today for the latest episode of Talking Tax. I understand this is our last show of the year, so it's the holiday season. I, you can see I've got my holiday season colors shirt on. Uh, but in any case, um, my co-host and um, the real man of the hour or the half hour, as the case may be, uh, for this show is Tom Yamachika, president of the Tax Foundation of Hawaii. And the man you really want to talk to when it comes to tax policy in Hawaii. And we also have a special guest today, Dan Mitchell, Daniel J. Mitchell, uh, founder and co founder and president of the Center for Freedom and Prosperity in Washington, D.C., all the way from Washington. He joins us today. We're so very grateful. And he is also an expert on tax reform, uh, as well as international tax competition um and um the economic burden of government he's uh, uh, we brought him out to hawaii i i didn't mention it but i'm with the grassroots institute of hawaii comms director and managing editor and we actually had time out here a couple of years ago to talk about uh spending caps and how to you know control spending uh, in hawaii but today we're actually talking about the flip side of spending or the the other uh taxes we're talking about taxes you can't spend if you don't have money to spend and 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 the way they raise money around here is through taxes. So um, the springboard for our discussion is a column that Kaliti Akina, president of the Grassroots Institute, uh, wrote this past week. Um, it was about the easiest way to raise taxes. Um, Hawaii's economy, um, as the title of this episode indicates, um, isn't doing so well. We had a three point five billion dollar. Uh, surplus estimated for this year at the end at the beginning of at the end of last year um, but then the legislature kind of blew through that like crazy um, and now we have a sluggish economy for reasons that are somewhat out of our control and and we had the event on Maui which was uh, a tragedy and it's going to be costing a lot of extra money here and there for the government of Hawaii and the counties to to uh, try to help them out over there uh, so, the, so the question, so the point of the column ultimately for Kali'i was, well, how are we going to raise taxes to pay for everything? Um, coincidentally, the government, the state is also going out to market right now, trying to borrow seven hundred fifty million dollars, and they put out a forecast saying, you know, sounding, making, putting on the rose-colored glasses, making it sound pretty good, but really, uh, things aren't looking so good. And what we're afraid of, or what a lot of people are afraid of, is that we're going to have to raise that a lot of the legislators uh, are going to look for ways to increase tax revenues by raising taxes. Kaliti's argument essentially in the article was that we might do better uh, lowering taxes because there's a lot of research shows that that's a good way to do it. So uh, kind of a less more philosophy. Um, I'm, and so that's one reason we've invited Tom, uh, Dan Mitchell here to join us today. Uh, he's an expert on that topic, but let's start with you, Tom. What did you think that? Uh, what did? What was your thoughts about that thesis of 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 Kali'i's that less is more, that lowering the taxes might be the way to uh, increase revenue in Hawaii? Does the Tax Foundation ever look at that idea? Well, I mean, it's has a lot of support in the in the economic literature, but I'm just kind of afraid that uh, you know, with politics. At the state capital, the way it is, uh, it's going to be very tough for uh, for that argument to take root. Uh, we at the, at the legislature, we go and do our budgeting based on projections of the state economy that the state council on revenues puts out every so often, uh, <clears throat> which is a a board of uh, economic types uh, that is uh, appointed by the governor confirmed by the Senate and uh, it and it remains kind of intact from uh, from session to session so there's a lot of continuity there uh, the, the forecasts have kind of gone south uh, you know after Lahaina burned down um, which is of course not surprising at all and it's kind of going to stay going to stay that way and like in order to fund some of the repairs in Lahaina, uh, the governor this year had to divert, you know, many millions of dollars from other programs. 
And uh, when the, once the legislative session starts, you know, the constituencies behind said other programs are going to come and say, well, look, we need to be made whole, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and there's going to be tremendous pressure to, you know, to get that revenue back. And certainly if you cut taxes and you get some long-term economic effect, uh, I mean, that'll be a, you know, a good thing and, and the budget and the budget may balance eventually, but in the short term, um, that that's going to be a tough sell. In the short term, it is an election, and um, that would make it a bit harder, I would imagine, also to raise taxes. But but in the short term, we're already the highest tax burden in the country. Um, wouldn't it? Would that be? Would you? Are you saying perhaps that instead of raising taxes, they would at least control their spending? Well, that would be a uh, that would be a viable alternative. Yes. I mean, I think we ought to be, you know, putting pressure on our legislators to do that. I mean, we, we can't, as a government, be all things to all people. So we have to concentrate on what we can do and what we can't, and what we can't do, you know, we leave to others. Um, Dan, what are your thoughts on this subject? Uh, the balance between spending and and uh, and and taxes, and 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 I should add too that that. Um, the governor did cut one hundred billion dollars um, from the twenty twenty three legislature's spending package, and it was still over the legal spending cap, as was the governor's own budget. But he actually cut a billion bucks away from the from the budget, and we still are in this mess. Um, and also that um, Kali'i Akina, in his column, had a targeted three taxes in particular to to try to to cut. One would be the state personal income tax. Uh, this another one was the corporate income tax, and then the estate tax. He said there's others, but that he thought those would be a good start. So, so what's your idea about this? Less is more, cutting spending, and those three taxes. I'm all in favor of having the lowest possible uh, marginal tax rates on productive behavior. Have a low personal income tax, a low corporate tax. I mean, heck, I actually like the states with zero income tax the most. Uh, having said that. I'm not sure that you can make an argument all the time uh, or, e or even most of the time that lowering tax rates raises revenue. I'm a big believer in the Laffer curve, but the Laffer curve simply means that when you lower tax rates, you get more taxable income. It then becomes an empirical question. Well, you lose revenue because of the lower rate, but you gain revenue because of the increase in taxable income. And which of those two things is bigger than the other? In some cases, like when Reagan cut tax rates significantly in the 1980s, we got a lot more revenue from rich taxpayers. Uh, would lowering the marginal tax rate, and Hawaii does have a very high personal income tax, if you lower that by a point or two, would that raise revenue, at least in the short run? That would be probably a difficult sell, but I don't view that as a problem because good tax policy is one half of the equation. The other half of the equation is, have some spending restraint. Now, it's kind of ironic talking to you guys out in Hawaii about this because you know normally when I'm speaking to a to an audience, I say what you need is a spending cap. Well, you guys already have one. The problem is your politicians just just uh, you know wave it. You know, they say, oh, it doesn't count for this year, and you do that every year, year after year. So so maybe you need a spending cap, but instead of what you have a sixty percent or two thirds requirement to waive it. You know, maybe you need 105% of the legislature to waive it. That way, that way it would actually be a real discipline. But yes, cool. control spending. Uh, and I guess it's good that the governor cut a billion dollars out of an ever-growing baseline of government. But obviously more needs to be done to get spending under control because you know, Hawaii also, by the way, not only do you have a high spending burden and a high tax burden, but your government pension debt is uh, among the highest in the country. So there, there are a lot of fiscal issues to work on. Well, Tom, um, as you know, that one of the other suggestions that uh, the governor made last year was, well, early this year, the last legislative session was to peg the uh, inter peg the personal income tax to inflation rate. We have, like, I think we have 11 brackets. We have the second most brackets in, in, of uh, personal income tax in the country. 
I think California has 13. I might be wrong about those figures, but we're way yeah, up. I think we have 12. Yeah, 12. Thank you. Uh, you would know. Um, and and, uh, and the problem is, you know, uh, many of the brackets are, are, are almost meaningless now because, you know, somebody who earns at the federal poverty line is already in the fourth bracket. Wow. So um, you you can you can kind of expect right because the brackets were enacted I think in the 1960s, uh, which which makes them a little bit dated. Uh, but that kind of gets into one of your other issues, and and that is you know what tax types should we should be should we be looking at, and uh, to to kind of uh, refocus a little bit on the personal income tax I think is good because. Um, when you look at how much revenue is produced by the corporate income tax, it's not very much. And by the estate and gift tax, not very much. Well, I mean, we don't have a gift tax, so the, the estate and generation skipping tax, that's not very much. Those, those are two drops in the bucket. The, the two 800-pound gorillas in the room for our tax system are the personal income tax, not the corporate income tax, the personal income tax, Right, because you know, so many more people are affected, and the general excise tax, which is our equivalent of the sales tax. Now, the um, likelihood that people are going to are going to touch the general excise tax is, is very very small. Uh, it's just it's just too dangerous, um, because it I mean, even a uh, a little bit of adjustment to the GE tax. Is, is many, many hundreds of millions of dollars. So, so, so people tend to leave that alone. Uh, if, if lawmakers are considering like, uh, you know, 50 basis point or 100 basis point increase in the general excise tax, people are going to notice and people are going to, are going to start, you know, calling legislative offices uh, and, and, and they will be upset, uh, which of course is not, not the greatest thing to have happened in an election year, like you mentioned. So, so let's talk about the personal income tax, uh, which I think is the, uh, the, um, you know, the, the lever with, you know, out of the three that were mentioned in the article, the one that has the most punch. And uh, I think, yeah, uh, we really shouldn't be taxing uh, uh, people who are at the federal poverty line. Uh, you know, having them in the fourth taxable bracket from the bottom is is absolutely insane as a policy matter. So, um, my recommendation would be at least, you know, to uh, to eliminate the bottom brackets. And uh, and yes, last year the governor had proposed indexing uh, the brackets for inflation. A lot of, you know, most states do that. We don't. We haven't done that for many, many years. Uh, and all kinds of you know, different excuses were given. I think the most recent one being, well, you know, our, uh, our computer system can't take it. Oh. Um, but that was, you know, but that was before 2000. Uh, now the, the computer system is different. And it can do a lot more things um, at, at, at lower cost. And it doesn't necessarily mean reprogram, reprogram, reprogramming the entire uh, system at, with a million dollar price tag. So it's a good idea, but it's not feasible? It's a good idea, uh, but, I, I, but I think there's going to be a, a lot of effort that's needed to make sure that un legislators understand what's going on and and buy into it. Uh, last year, uh, when when the governor tried to do that, uh, the Speaker of the House came out and said, well, this, this is too complicated. And I'm thinking to myself, what's too complicated? You look up, you know, you look up your, your income in a table to to get your tax anyway. If the if the numbers in in the table change a little bit, uh, how much more complicated is that? You're, you're you're doing the same amount of effort. Yeah, uh, Dan, are you aware of any other states uh, or countries even that that might that do this? 
index their income tax to the rate of inflation? Certainly, the United States, we went to indexing back uh, during the Reagan years, and that uh, that eliminated what's called bracket creep, where over time, you just wind up being in a higher tax bracket simply because the overall price level increases. But there's also something called real bracket creep, and that's when uh, your income goes up and you just wind up being in higher tax brackets, and then you're facing higher marginal tax rates, so your incentive to further climb the ladder is a little bit diminished. Uh, I don't know what the status is on other countries. Uh, I suspect uh, most of them do index, especially since we had that horrible bout of inflation in the 60s and 70s. I suspect there was pressure pressure in all countries to make those reforms. And then, of course, we've almost globally, we had another bout of inflation just in the last couple of years. Uh, but even though we had that bout of inflation, I, I, I do follow international tax developments. And I did not see much uh, uh, reporting at all about uh, bracket creep. And uh, so I, I suspect that most countries do index, but I'm afraid I just don't have that kind of information at my fingertips. Oh, well, about the GET, what, what's your thoughts about that here in Hawaii? It's, it's not really a sales tax. Uh, it's a gross income. It's a gross receipts tax. Um, it, it's, you know how it works, right? Yeah, it is a remarkable uh, tax compared to the normal sales taxes in, in most uh, states in America. Now, of course, the, the, the normal sales tax in a state might have different items exempted, like you know, groceries or clothing or uh, things like that. So it's not like they're simple and pure uh, uh, revenue raising mechanisms. Uh, but your general excise tax, if I understand correctly, you have a lot of what's called cascading in that. Uh, where, where as a good moves through the production uh, process, it, it might get taxed over and over again. Uh, and so it's not the most efficient tax, but uh, it, it certainly, as uh, was just mentioned, it, it's a major revenue source for the state and politicians would be very, very reluctant to do anything that curtailed their ability uh, to generate that revenue because they want the money to spend so they can buy their way to re-election. Yeah. Well, that, that plus uh, when... People talk about the general excise tax, they look at the nominal rate, which is 4%, and they go, oh my God, you know, amongst all of the states in the country, that's pretty darn low. Yeah. So uh, yeah. why don't we get up there, you know, jack it up 100, uh, you know, 100 basis points, or 200 basis points, get it on par with some of the other sales tax states. And uh, that is, I think, a real fallacy because uh, most, sales tax states, they only, they only tax tangible personal property sales and maybe a, a service or two. We tax everything, um, tangible personal property sales, sales of services, intangibles, interest, rent, um, lots of things that you know, most sales taxes just leave alone. Uh, our our tax is you know broader Tom, based than even the New Mexico gross receipts tax. Tom, can I ask you? Is my memory correct that there's a problem with cascading with the GET? Well, yeah, of course there is. Um, all, all gross receipts taxes have uh, have a permitting problem. Uh, ours tries to compensate for that by uh, assigning a lower rate to like B two B transactions. So uh, instead of applying like the the full four point five percent with you know with county surcharge, uh, we apply only 05 percent. But that's still you know that that's still cascading. That's still pyramiding. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we do have a lot of exemptions for the GET. I I I wonder. You know, a lot of people would like more. In fact, the governor was proposing more initially last year for the. 2023 session uh, for food and groceries. Um, are you, uh, what's your thought, Tom, about exemptions for the GET? Uh, I think just like last year uh, with the current economic conditions, uh, selling a, a GET exemption, you know, even a small one is going to be very tough. Uh, you try to sell a big one, it's going to be DOA. Well, it, it, but, but I was surprised because, I mean, the general population, I would think, if you did polls, would say, yeah, we want a GET exemption for food and, and medicines. 
and and you know whatever. Well, who uh, wouldn't? Right. So 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 why, why wouldn't the, the politicians respond to that? Are they so concerned? That, isn't this where like they should be cutting their spending? And what what's the problem here? Why do we have to pay such high taxes on necessities, so called? Well, I think the problem happens whenever you try to cut something. There's a constituency behind it, and said constituency goes to the politicians and says, "You can't do this." Like, for example, if you want to, you know, try to cut an environmental program, um, uh, hordes of people go into the hearing and say, "You can't do this." You know, got to save the planet and all that kind of stuff. Uh, you cut another program uh, that you know subsidizes agriculture. All the farmers show up and say, you can't do this. We're going to decimate our industry. And so on and so on. There's always a constituency. And there's always people who show up and say, you, know, you can't do this. Well, those are people that would not want their exemptions taken away, right? That's right. Right. But I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting maybe we should have more GET exemptions. I'm just trying to look at how we could lower... Uh, increase economic activity um, to, you know, going back to the idea of the article, um, when it, there's never a good time to raise taxes if you ask politicians. And, and you know, if the times are good, they'll say, no, we can't do that because we have to look ahead for the future. Or we have all these new ideas about where we want to spend our money, you know. Um, well, I think in our state, it's been kind of more of the latter. Yeah, we have all these great ideas to spend our money, uh, like this uh, centralized training hub for first responders in the middle part of our state. Uh, that's one of the you know projects that got cut uh, yeah. in that one one billion dollar uh, slice that that uh, that the governor uh, gave the, the budget last year, and uh, there was a very powerful constituency behind that one. Well, I'll get off philosophical here for a minute. Um, I, I'm I'm constantly amazed at how many people in Hawaii, well, actually everywhere, but there actually is, is a a prominent think tank here that that all they ever talk about is raising taxes, um, either that or or spending programs, which obviously means you know you got to pay for it. Um, and and that idea going in Hawaii, the, that idea of having progressive income taxes. Um, special, special funds, taxes, tax credits, um, on and on, um, as a way to manipulate policy. They really believe that tax using the tax system is the best way to achieve our our goals here. But if you do that, how do you actually lower the cost of living and increase opportunity and and generate a friendly business climate? We have one of the worst business climates in the state. I, I'll throw that out to you, uh, Dan. Hawaii's problem is that people vote with their feet. Now, obviously, it's easier to vote with your feet and move from California to Texas or to move from New York to Florida. But even still, people move in and out of Hawaii. And when you have one of the highest income tax rates in the country, not to mention a death tax, which uh, uh, plays in the minds of uh, rich senior citizens. Uh, and you know, it's not just fiscal policy, by the way. If you look at the uh, Economic Freedom of North America, published by the Fraser Institute. Hawaii is in the bottom five for overall economic policy. Uh, you look at uh, Freedom in the 50 States, just published by the uh, Cato Institute. Hawaii is in the bottom five of all states looking at overall economic policy. A and these kinds of things add up. Uh, it doesn't take that many successful people moving out of your state. You know, Maybe it's only a couple of hundred a, a year, but when it Especially happens year after year, it, it just creates this, this wedge effect of lost income for the state and lost tax revenue for the politicians, which sort of brings us back to what we were talking about earlier, Mark. Which yeah, is that, as a know, matter of fact, our, yes. our, our censuses have told us uh, that we lose about 11,000 people a year. And it's been that way for the past few years. Yes. And that, that adds up and it means lost revenue. So it, it, it's more evidence that there is a laffer curve that politicians should be paying attention to. Yeah, it always amazes me um, uh, that this could go on for
for so long. Um, it's kind of like the housing crisis, you know, uh, not to switch gears here, but uh, how, how, what, you know, what does it take to, uh, to shake up the, the legislature, the Capitol building, the square building, I think you call it, Tom. Um, well, we're coming close to the ending here, but, but about spending cuts, uh, you know, uh, Dan, you were quite a, when we brought you out here in Hawaii, uh, to Hawaii a few years ago, you talked about uh, the spending cap, you know, a, a spending cap with teeth. Um, and you talked about Colorado being a good example. We have a spending cap, but it has no teeth. Um, what do you think about that now? Uh, and 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 Tom, jump in if you got any thoughts about that. Is there a way we can really bring the state legislative spending under control so that taxes isn't always the big issue? What makes the Colorado spending cap, Paul Tabor, Taxpayer Bill of Rights, what makes the Colorado spending cap effective is that it limits tax revenue to population plus inflation. Anything above that automatically gets rebated to taxpayers. So every year, taxpayers are now expecting, I want this money back. And it makes it very hard for politicians for politicians to say, no, no, we're going to keep it. We're going to spend it on some of our buddies and our friends and our campaign contributors. So I think maybe if Hawaii's spending cap uh, also was modified to include a revenue cap with excess revenue going back to taxpayers, that might create a different political dynamic. Yeah, um, certainly I, it would require a constitutional change. Uh, and even, you know, when Colorado did change its constitution to adopt Tabor, um, there were there were lawsuits challenging it as an infringement on the legislature the legislature's power. Uh, but that, you know, fortunately, the Supreme Court at the time said no, it no it doesn't. Yeah. Um, taxpayers are kings, so. That Tabor uh, being the taxpayer uh, bill of rights. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Well, um, gentlemen, um, happy holidays to both of you and to all of our listeners and, and viewers out there. Uh, I want to give a special thanks for Dan to join from for joining us all the way from Washington D.C. through the wonders of technology here. Uh, have a great, great, great to be on the program, Mark. Thank you, Dan. Good to see you. And go, go Bulldogs! Right. Uh, I'm an FSU grad, and he's a Georgia Tech. He's a no, a, a Georgia grad, and uh, and they're both facing off in the Orange Bowl in a few uh, couple of weeks. And Tom, what was your what was your alma mater? Oh, I, I'm a Yale Bulldog. Oh wow, that's cool. Yeah, <laughs> so so I saw um, I, I saw Daniel's uh, Connecticut license plate with uh, you know Go Dogs on it, and I went, oh, must must be Yale Bulldogs. Because it's blue, also, right? Which well, is so our, would you be for the Bulldogs? Uh, so are you in, by default? Would you be for the uh, for the uh, Georgia in the Orange Bowl because of their uh, I, I'm nonpartisan in the Orange Bowl. <laughs> well, thank, like a politician. <laughs> thank you both again, and thank, well, thank you, you viewers again for being here today. Hope you uh, learned something and enjoyed the conversation, and we'll see you. This is our last show of the year. Um, we'll see you next year. All, all the best. Aloha.